When I'm looking for an actor to feature, there are a number of factors I consider. Are they recognizable by the average viewer? Are they too famous? Does this actor give me a chance to talk about a specific topic that I think people would be interested to hear about, like the history of blacks in cinema, or the challenges of being an actor with a physical or mental disability? All of these thoughts come into play, but at the end of the day, I usually have to like the person. Every actor I've done a biographical episode on, I've fallen in love with. I have to care about these people, otherwise the days and weeks spent creating these episodes wouldn't be that enjoyable. That's probably why I'll never do an episode about child pornographer and registered sex offender Jeffrey Jones. That being said, this episode is the first exception to that rule. Meet Norbert Gruppe an actor most known for playing the role of Vigo the Carpathian in the 1989 film Ghostbusters 2. I first became aware of this man's story when one of my subscribers, Michael O'Hara, hey Michael, suggested I read an article titled The Hateful Life and Spiteful Death of the Man Who Was Vigo the Carpathian, written for Deadspin.com by Sean Revive. If you haven't read the article yet, please click the link in the description box below and check it out. Think of this episode as sort of an unofficial companion piece to the article. I got most of my information from it. Norbert Gruppe was born on August 25th, 1940 in Berlin, Germany. His father, Richard Gruppe, was a baker and eventually became a professional boxer and wrestler. His mother? Well, he never knew her or even spoke to her. He tried when he was younger. He knew where she lived and would sit on her front steps for hours hoping she would talk to him. Rona, Norbert's sister, said she would peek out the curtain and he would never leave. He couldn't understand why his own mother wouldn't talk to him. After Norbert was born, his father married and had another son, Winfried. So Norbert lived with his father, a stepmother, and a half-brother. He was the bastard son. He really felt like an outsider. As Norbert grew up, he had odd jobs around Berlin. He was a meat packer, a stevedore, a butcher, a longshoreman, and a waiter. Most importantly, his father trained him as a boxer as he grew. In 1960, Norbert moved with his father to California to pursue a career in professional wrestling. Together, they fought as tag team partners. They called themselves the Vikings. Later on, they used their German heritage as an opportunity to play villains in the wrestling world. They were known as the Von Hamburg brothers, and they would lose on purpose to American wrestlers. Die Luft sauber gesprüht und äh, den Ballet gemacht von meinem Papa. When Norbert would later become a boxer full-time, he made his boxing title Prince Wilhelm von Hamburg, a decision he would later regret when trying to get into acting work post-World War II. In der in der Industrie, die äh, beherrscht wird von der jüdischen Welt, sich da von Hamburg zu nennen, war natürlich ganz doof. As a wrestler, Norbert perfected the art of being an asshole. Think Andy Kaufman's wrestling persona. It was perfect for the world of wrestling, especially when you're playing the heel. But when Norbert switched to boxing in 1962, he kept the wrestling attitude. In 1964, Norbert moved back to Germany and became one of the most notorious asshole boxers in the country. Everybody came to see him. Revive writes, he wore fur coats, smoked cigars, and taunted referees, trainers, and the crowds. He posed in the ring, and he walked around town like he owned it. He spat at the crowd. It's a good way to sell tickets, and Norbert sold a lot of them. Although whenever he lost a boxing match, it really affected him. You might call him a sore loser. Now, if you're putting on the act of a sore loser, you might say that it sells more tickets because it's more satisfying for the viewer to watch you lose. But for Norbert, I get the feeling that it was never an act. In the documentary, The Boxing Prince, which focuses on Gruppe's life and career, he watches old boxing matches and gets angry all over again just watching. Da kriegt der Mann 80.000 Mark für und ich habe gekriegt 20. Ja, war ja, ich war ja bescheiden, weil ich wusste, ich kann mit dem Mann was machen. Wenn er in den Hammer reinläuft, ist Daddle Du. 
Und als es richtig bergab geht in der elften Runde, wo ich das Auge aufmache mit dem längeren Haken und er mimt auf Kopfstoß, da schickt mich der alte Franzose nach Hause. Na, ich werde blöde, wenn ich da heute an denke. In one particular match against Argentinian boxer Oscar Bonavina, he gets TKO'd. The next day, he gave an infamously uncomfortable interview on live television, if you could call it an interview. Wie fühlen Sie sich nach den fünf Niederschlägen von gestern Abend? Die waren gestern Abend, ne? Ja, gestern Abend, ne? Wie geht's Ihnen dann? Gut? Heute geht's mir gut. Geht's wieder gut. Äh, Sie haben sich bei irgendeinem Niederschlag den Knöchel verletzt. Sind Sie umgekippt? Er ist umgekippt, ich weiß, er hat mir das vorher erzählt. Ich fand sie in der zweiten Runde besser, muss ich Ihnen sagen, als jetzt im Augenblick. Ich fand sie echt besser, denn da taten sie was und jetzt schweigen sie. Warum schweigen sie? Na, ihr Lächeln ist ja auch ganz hübsch. Also machen wir eine andere Frage, wenn Sie auf die nicht antworten wollen. War vielleicht der Gewichtsunterschied zu groß? 18 Pfund. Perhaps it was Norbert's reputation as a boxer that earned him his first acting role, a bare-fisted fighter in a 1964 episode of Gunsmoke. Get out of my way! Take my advice and make a run for it, fella. Jake will crush you to death. Yes, you catch me first. I'll bust every bone in your body. Yeah, the other fellow knows how to take care of himself. He's a boxer. You mean one of them prize fight fellas? That's right. It's kind of worth the price of admission, ain't it? By golly, it sure is. In the episode, Norbert's character is conflicted about accepting a bribe to throw a big fight. He takes the money, doesn't throw the fight, and shares the bribe with his opponent. What's really funny about this role is that he comes across so noble, giving his opponent the dirty bribe money, when in real life, Norbert would have probably thrown the fight and kept all the money himself. He didn't care. And I'm not just speculating, he had no qualms about it. Listen to Norbert as he bitterly relives an old match against Italian boxer Piero Del Papa for the European Light Heavyweight Championship. Ich wollte Europameister werden, weil in England hätte auf sicher irgendeiner den Titel haben wollen oder Boxen für Boxen wollen und ich hätte vielleicht meine ganze Gage auf meinen Gegner gewettet und hätte mich gekonnt hingelegt und hätte grausig angeschafft. Das habe ich aber alles schon vorgehabt und geplant und dann kam dieser Onanist aus Frankreich und hat mir das gestohlen, diese Möglichkeit. As far as his acting goes, he wasn't bad. For a first role in film or TV, a guest star in an episode of Gunsmoke was pretty big. A number of his roles after Gunsmoke were small bit parts. Sometimes he played silent, intimidating characters. The muscle. He certainly had the right look for it. Every once in a while, like in Gunsmoke, he would just play a boxer. Another thing that helped him get roles was him just being German and being fluent in German. He played up to the stereotypes in certain roles, like this one in an episode of Jericho in 1966. God damn it, man. Also, it's clear that his wrestling background helped him in roles where he had to be physical and do some stunt work, like in this episode of The Invaders in 1967. He played three different roles in episodes of The Wild Wild West. He played a silent boxer, a dim-witted crook. And what'd you do to get the law down on you? You shoot somebody? Not a bad southern accent, if that's his real voice. Might have been dubbed, I'm not sure. And a German henchman. If you blink, you'll miss him. During these acting jobs, he continued boxing. One thing that's pretty evident about Norbert, especially in the documentary, is that he was a prideful man, and it stung him when he was made out to look like a fool. But where did his pride end? In the boxing world, he obviously had no issues with throwing a match just for the money. But on the flip side of that, it seems like he really took himself seriously as a boxer, having this image that he wanted to live up to. So I wonder how he felt about being a small fish in a big pond in the world of film and television, taking parts that are kind of less than flattering and having little to no dialogue. Norbert continued boxing and acting until 1970 when he was arrested after a sting operation in Germany for a number of crimes. 
extortion, pimping, and drug dealing. During the 60s, he was spending a lot of time in the Red Light District in Hamburg, hanging out with a local chapter of the Hells Angels. He got heavily into drugs, alcohol, prostitutes, you name it. He ended up retiring permanently from boxing and focused 100% on becoming an actor. After a six-year gap, some of that spent in prison, one of his first roles in his return to acting was in the Werner Herzog film, Stroshek. He plays an intimidating criminal and does a fantastic job. Fotze! Ich grab ihn dir hier vorne ein, den Zwerg. So hoch oder so tief du willst. Als Weihnachtsbaum. Mit Lametta und Kugeln. Aber bitte, bitte befrei mich von diesem Kreteng. Bitte, 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 bitte. He's menacing, he's unpredictable, and just an all-around asshole to the main character. This is one of my favorite scenes of his in the film. Watching this, he really is a natural. He's managed to simply be in the scene. A lot of this seems improvised, although I can't be sure. He's really good, which begs the question, is this what he was like in real life? It doesn't seem too far removed from his days in the red light district of Hamburg. And that's not speculation. A number of people interviewed in the documentary about him describe his life as dangerous. Here, director Werner Herzog describes when and how he discovered Norbert and decided to cast him in this film. Nachdem ich den Prinzen kennengelernt habe, habe ich ihn gebeten, nimm mich doch mal mit auf den Kiez, möglichst zu einer Sache, wo gestritten wird, wo wo die Situation gefährlich auch werden kann. Und er wurde ja oft als Streitschlichter eingesetzt und nahm mich mit eine ganze Nacht lang in eine Situation, wo ich mir dachte, um Gottes Willen, ich möchte nicht derjenige sein, der jetzt was verkehrt gemacht hat und mit einer der Mädchen abhauen wollte und der etwas gemacht hat, was dem Ehrenkodex auf dem Kiez widersprochen hat. Und der Prinz war obwohl er ja nicht direkt beteiligter war, derartig klar und intelligent und gleichzeitig aber auch von einer Gefährlichkeit, die, die mich in, in Schrecken und Erstaunen gesetzt hat. Und ich sagte ihm, genau so etwas brauchen wir auch für den Film Strosche. Im Grunde genommen ist ja auch dieser, der Prinz von Homburg, Norbert, ist ja ein ganz lieber Kern, ganz tief innen drin, obwohl er ganz sicher auch etwas... Äh, ungeordnetes, gefährliches, gemeingefährliches in sich hat, fast so wie Mike Tyson. Für meine Begriffe ist er jemand fast wie, wie der deutsche Mike Tyson. After Stroshek, he didn't work again as an actor until 11 years later. I can't find anything that accounts for this gap of time, but his next job must have been a lucrative one in terms of the residuals he got. He played James, a henchman to Alan Rickman's character Hans Gruber in Die Hard. His next job after that was the big one, Vigo the Carpathian in Ghostbusters 2. What? Who? I, Vigo, the scourge of Carpathia, the sorrow of Moldavia, command you. Oh, command me, Lord. On a mountain of skulls in the castle of pain, I sat on a throne of blood. Unfortunately for Norbert, his dialogue was completely dubbed by veteran actor Max von Sydow. Norbert had no idea his dialogue was going to be dubbed. It's kind of like what David Prowse went through when he played Darth Vader. Start tearing this shit apart, piece by piece, until you've found those tapes. 
Find the passengers of this vessel. I want them alive! When you watch the raw footage of Norbert's performance, you can see how his dialogue wasn't necessarily going to work. I, Eagle, the scourge of Carpathia, the sorrow of Malaria, I command you. On the mountain of skulls and the castle of pain, I sit on the throne of blood. Okay, now move your head a little bit. Although you could argue that they could have gone in the direction of it being so not intimidating that it sort of becomes intimidating. But they went the other route. An effects artist who worked on the film said, Poor Wilhelm von Homburg. It seems no one told him his voice was replaced. He found out firsthand at the screening and soon after stormed out of the theater. As a separate note, when Sean Revive was doing research for his article, he emailed one of the executive producers of Ghostbusters 2, Michael C. Gross, and asked him about Norbert. Mr. Gross wrote back just one sentence. I can only say he was a crude, bigoted asshole. After Ghostbusters 2, he had bit parts in Night of the Warrior. Well, hey, Bob, aren't we gonna get a good night kiss? I'm a married man, I keep telling you girls that. <laughs> and we're gonna keep trying to make you forget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on. And the parody, The Silence of the Hams. Excuse me, miss. They exactly where is the unbelievably bad maniac swing? Follow me. He also had a pretty sizable role in John Carpenter's In the Mouth of Madness. Okay, it's been messing with the church. Now something came leaking out, took the little ones first and passed it on to us. Can I buy you a beer? Don't let it get to you, just get out! The last role he had was in what looks to be a European TV show called Rosa Roth. After that, he wasn't seen on film until 2002, when filmmaker Gerd Krosky interviewed him for a documentary, Der Boxprinz, or in English, The Boxing Prince. According to Revive, when Krosky decided to begin researching for the documentary, Norbert's whereabouts were unknown. He finally found him in Los Angeles, but had to fly out and meet him three times before he agreed to the documentary. The whole film documents Norbert's life and career as an athlete and actor. The director interviews Norbert, as well as many of his old friends and acquaintances he had throughout the years, who don't have too many good things to say about him. You know, we have much, we were not befriended, and then had him in the night, he said, the ring cloud, or Später hat er gesagt, ich wäre dabei gewesen, der den Ring geklaut hätte. Das war Kinderei. Hatte. Aber der Mann, den nehme ich nicht mehr für voll. Gewirkt hat auf mich, naja, beängstigend, ja. Was soll ich sagen, gewirkt hat? Mm -hmm. Die Augen. Und warum beängstigend? Die Augen. Ich gucke immer so auf die Augen. Was hast du da gesehen in den Augen? Ich habe Angst gehabt. Nur, er hat sich eben durch das ewige Drogen oder was er alles, ich weiß nicht genau, was er alles genommen hat, auf jeden Fall durch seine Exzesse und Alkohol und was weiß ich, hat er eben den, den, den Kürzeren gezogen. Ne? Sonst, der Kubel, das war der, für mich der Beste, der, der in Deutschland rumlief. Vom, vom, vom Können. Der, der konnte auch boxen, der konnte sich auch queen, ich sag das nochmal wieder. Der konnte auch hauen, der konnte auch, der konnte alles. Nur, der hat sich durch sein Lebenswandel kaputt gemacht. So sieht's aus. One friend, Stefan Henschel, an ex-boxer and alleged pimp, had some nice things to say, but he tells it like it is. Hat auch vielen Leuten über Mopu gemacht, und ein zweites Loch in den Arsch gedreht. Das konnte par excellence, ne? Der Inhalt sicherlich auch seine Erziehung irgendwo, aber er ist eigentlich nicht geliebt worden, ne? Ein extremer Mann, das Zeit voraus. Ja. A little tangent here, but at one point the documentary crew is following this guy down a strip in Hamburg. A homeless guy approaches, and this happens. Noch ein Problem. Besser ist es. So, komm weiter. Ich hab da keinen Bock drauf, hier mit den Arschlöchern rumzureden. As Revive says in his article, a few years later, Henschel hanged himself from a hook meant to hold a punching bag. These were Norbert's friends. Back to Norbert, whenever he was being interviewed about his boxing career, he always seems to be focusing on the failures, always talking about if things had gone a different way, he might be better off now. Weil wir da zu der Zeit war kein Fernsehen interessiert, da musste man von den Einnahmen leben, die man da an der Kasse bringen konnte. Und das war nicht sehr viel. Das ist heute erheblich mehr, ne? weil heute das Fernsehen überträgt und es mittlerweile fünf Weltmeister gibt, wo wir eigentlich nur einen brauchen. Und von den heutigen fünf Titeln hätte ich wahrscheinlich so anderthalb, zwei. 
und wäre viel, viel gestopfter in finanziellen Hinsicht, als ich das äh, heute sein darf. He comes off as obnoxious sometimes, but most of the time I ended up feeling bad for him. He had a rough life and alienated a lot of his family and friends. The documentary shows how he was spending his last years. He drunkenly meets with an old friend in a pizza shop who digs out an old record book. Yeah. Wilhelm von Homburg. Right, that's the guy, yeah. Right, right here. here. Sure, John. He attends an acting class, which he kind of struggles with. We're sitting out there minding our own business and Kuma felt like we was hit with a freight train, knocked by a but right in the ass, the customer started screaming. Okay, go back to the top of the page. Back Thank to God. The page. Okay, switch parts. He empties out an old storage container. Another tangent, I can't not talk about this. When I watched this documentary for the first time, I was really taken aback because it had some eerie similarities to one of my favorite movies, The Wrestler with Mickey Rourke. Both of them are burnt out wrestlers. They've alienated their loved ones. Their faces have seen better days. When you see both characters for the first time in their respective films, they're seen walking from behind through a gym. In the newspaper clippings, the long blonde hair in a ponytail, the reading glasses, the van, it's actually kind of bizarre. There's one thing the documentary doesn't mention, perhaps just because they didn't know, and that's Norbert was a closeted bisexual, according to an article written by Patricia Neal Warren. Maybe this is another reason why Norbert seemed to push people away. Sean Revive puts it nicely. As a weed-smoking, bisexual strongman in a time before that was acceptable by mainstream standards, perhaps Norbert felt distanced from the ultra-adrenaline-fueled world of boxing and wrestling that had made him famous. Or maybe the refusal of his own mother to talk to him pushed him to distrust and hate other people. Or maybe he was just an asshole. Shortly after the documentary was finished, Norbert was diagnosed with prostate cancer. He spent his last years pretty much homeless, sleeping at the YMCA, friends' houses, or in his van. He died on March 10th, 2004 over a friend's house in Mexico. Sadly, in his death, one thing he made sure to do was to continue to hurt people. Years prior, in 1988, when his father Richard Gruppe passed away, Norbert's sister, Rona, didn't tell him what had happened. She says, I didn't call Norbert when my dad died. I don't think he deserved it. He didn't love him. Cut to years later, Norbert knows he's dying and instructs a friend to deliver a message to Rona exactly one month after his own death. The message was to read, Touché. Rona didn't tell Norbert for weeks about their own father's death, and here, Norbert hoped to posthumously make Rona feel the same pain, and thus ended, as Sean Revive put it, the hateful life and spiteful death of the man who was Vigo the Carpathian. I don't know what to think about Norbert. I feel sorry for the way his life was early on, and those were the years that made him who he was, to find how he interpreted relationships, how he saw himself, how he thought the world worked, or how it ought to work, blaming others for his perceived shortcomings, holding on to hate and bitterness, and ultimately being consumed by it. Almost as if the psychochemical hate sludge from Ghostbusters 2 that gave Vigo all his power was actually real and did the same thing to Norbert. Negative human emotions are materializing in the form of a viscous psychoreactive plasm with explosive supernormal potential. All the bad feelings, I mean all the hate, the anger and violence of this city is turning into this sludge. In the end, the decisions Norbert made in his life were his own. There's an old saying, if you can't be a good example, then you'll just have to be a horrible warning. That seems to be the case with Norbert Gruppe. If there's anything good Norbert left behind in this world, maybe it was showing others what not to do. In any case, I hope that maybe in his last moments, he found some peace. Rest in peace, Norbert.